a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. This is Dan Durbin. This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birthright, and you're listening to The Krypton Report. Welcome to The Krypton Report, the all things Kryptonian podcast, where we talk about anything relating to Superman, Supergirl, Krypton, DC Comics, and TV, movies, video games, comics. I am your host, Tyler, the Superman of Blue, the man of tomorrow. All right, everybody. Welcome to this new episode of The Krypton Report. And today I am joined by fellow podcaster and friend. You may have heard me recently. I was on her show. Supergirl Radio, great podcast. Check it out. Fun, even more fun if you watch it live on YouTube. <laughs> but I'd like to welcome Rebecca to the show. Welcome, Rebecca. Well, thank you for having me. It was uh, such a pleasure to have you on Supergirl Radio. So I'm glad to speak with you again. Yeah, it, w- it was a blast, and you know, it's it's fun. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, just like doing the live thing that we're working on doing here now, and. I enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed it. So uh, not too long ago, last month in September, you did a panel at Dragon Con, and I was telling you off mic, but then I said, hey, you know what, we'll, we'll kind of save this, uh, where it was like a, well, would you say like a battle royale type thing of Superman. You had a panel of super fans and super podcasters, and I was like, if ever there was a panel of podcast people I should be on, this was this was the one I I loved I loved your dialogue with everybody, and I just kept I'm in my car driving, listening, to this, like <laughs> yelling, like yes, yes, that that no, no, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a, it was a good time, and yeah, ironically, yeah. the day I was listening to it, as I was driving store to store trying to find uh, my my kid's copy. That's right, my kid's copy of Zack Snyder's Justice League. <laughs> I was, I was like, "This is this is cool." I'm going to find this movie, and I'm listening to this podcast. Yeah, it was a it was a good time. It was a Dragon Con panel, and I had been uh, I've been doing panels at Dragon Con for a, a little while now, and uh, I saw that that was an option. And I didn't really know what it was. It was called Superman Battle Royale of Superman, and it was basically uh, just putting out categories of things like best suit, best hot. Uh, it was yeah, be- best suit. Uh, I think best Clark, best, you know, Superman, favorite Superman, uh, the Superman who most embodies the the Boy Scout, you know, those kinds of categories. So we had to pick uh, which of the Superman, the, I, well, and there were, it was mostly live action, but there were animated, uh, off, well, like best boys who had the best Superman boys. So, uh, so it was really fun because, uh, you know, I, I have different uh, likes about different Superman. So it, you know, I, oh, I didn't, yeah, we're going to get into some of it. Yeah. So I, I didn't have, you know, Henry Cavill is my answer to everything. And I think we, it was a pretty balanced uh, panel and we all, uh, we were all able to agree to disagree, which was great. I will say that listening to that panel, I did feel uh, somewhat sorry for the forgotten Superman um, because I'm 95% sure I will say I was driving when I was listening to it with headphones. So I could have missed them, but there was no mention of Kirk Allen. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, the like uh, yeah, there was a mention of Kirk Allen just in the idea of. So we have we were trying to eliminate Superman. To, okay. I guess eventually okay. tried to find the best Superman, and there was a, a a part of the panel where some somebody, my friend John, actually the podcast himself, uh, he uh, he mentioned like why why are we not talking about Kirk Allen I might have eliminated him first because his argument was Kirk Allen yes he was the first super you know live action Superman but he he didn't have anything that we recognize Superman day so it's kind of yeah. difficult to eliminate Kirk. like he, I guess he's kind of an easy choice to eliminate him but it's also kind of not fair because he didn't have all of the previous first Superman to kind of pull from so uh, the Kirk Allen of it is very, you know, uh, very complicated. Yeah. It's, it's interesting about his Superman just because it's like what he did, George Reeves came in and did it better. Yeah. And took it up because we, uh, I want to say two years ago, a year ago, I can't even keep track of time anymore. I think it, it might have been last year. 
we were doing this thing called pilot season where we were kind of just looking at the first pilot of every version of Superman. And we have been doing it for several years now. And we compared, you know, the, we did the first, I think, one or two episodes of the serials. Then we did the first episode of the George Reeves show. And how the, the first part of the George Reeves pilot is like the first part of the serial when it comes to mom, pa, and everything. But it's all a little bit better. And I agree with your argument about poor Kirk there. He, uh, like I, I say it not to be like mean, but really like the forgotten Superman are Kirk Allen, David Wilson, and even if you want to say, um, Bob Holiday. Oh yeah, Bob Holiday. What a what a wonderful voice. I have some of his. Uh, he's he's the one from the musical, right? The the Broadway. Musical. Mm-hmm. He did the he did the stage version. David Wilson did the. Uh, very hard to get through the, the TV version. Yeah. Well, of the, of the altered musical, <laughs> I, I will say Bob holiday. I have some of the tracks on my phone and I listen to them. Every- he has such a wonderful voice and he, and there's one of the songs. I can't remember the title of it, but it, it's, he sings of kind of sadness, what it's like for man, how hard it is. It. And it's just not something that you would maybe hear it. People people argue today that there's there's nothing there's nothing that should be sad about Superman or Superman shouldn't have doubt or he shouldn't have a problem. Um, but Bob Holiday's really? Superman, uh, yeah, some people do make that argument. He has to be happy and hopeful all the time. Uh, but it, that that song always reminds me that it is hard to be Superman. It, it would be hard to be Superman. So I I, I had, there's a special place for Bob Holiday in my heart. I mean. Of course, it's hard to be super. I mean, it's like the responsibility that falls on you. If I mean to be him, to be a good, like a good person. But yeah, the hopeful aspect he projects when he's around everyone. But when he is himself, like he's he carries the weight. Like oh yeah, um, you know. And I think I think about the lines like Superman Returns is such an interesting film because there's some really good stuff in there, and there's some stuff I just was like no, but like. What Martha says when she's like, um, oh, no, it's leaving my brain. Even if I, you are the last, it doesn't mean you're alone. Mm. Um, when he's talking about really feeling like, like he's alone and stuff, I mean, that would be something that would weigh on you. But All right, so we have some questions here. And these are questions that I like to ask when anybody shows up here on the podcast. So we're going to start. Some are going to be quick. Some are going to be like, Thought provoking. Okay, sounds go. good. And I'll probably and I'll probably think of like five hundred more after we're done. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so, I'm a number here. How did your fandom start? Like with the whole Supergirl, Superman, like the whole Kryptonian zeitgeist. Was it Superman first, then Supergirl, or would you read you expose to Supergirl first? Then uh, where did it all start for you? That's really that's a hard question. I guess uh, a lot of us in. Uh, I guess born in the seventies and eighties, I guess Superman has always just been kind of there. Uh, but I think probably Superman first, I probably had seen Christopher Reeve first. Uh, but I did watch the Helen Slater movie as a kid, the Supergirl movie as a kid. And I loved it. People trash it today, but when I was growing up, I loved it. I loved Selena as a villain. Uh, I thought Helen Slater was a good Supergirl. I thought kind of the, magical mystical aspect of it even though i didn't totally understand it i enjoyed it and so i i grew up loving that movie and it wasn't until i got older that i realized everyone hated it (laughs) because i thought i thought it was a lot of fun um so i guess for the super side of things probably chris Reeve would have been my first touchstone um but it wasn't until um because i used to and i don't know if this is like a dirty little secret but I used to be, and I say used to be, because I think it's changed for me, but I used to be more of Batman. So uh, so I grew up, like, Batman 89 was, like, damn, uh, I love Tim Burton movies. Um, and so Batman has always been a, kind of a, a thing that has cared who's gone with me my whole life. But uh, but I think uh, I think it's changed a little bit. I think I now prefer the super stuff more than Batman stuff. But I, I guess that kind of changes a little bit. But... I think for me, when I when I really got into Superman, it would have been 
I don't know, 2005 or so, um, because a friend of mine had recommended Smallville to me. She knew I loved villains, and she That's was a like, good friend. and she yeah, and she was like, uh, the Lex Luthor on the show is really good. You should check it out. And so I got into Smallville. I kind of grew uh, out out of love with Smallville, but I, I still see Smallville as like my introduction to the more to Superman in a in a real sense. Like I knew who Superman was. I knew who Lois Lane was. I knew how what that world was. But Smallville actually got me wanting to read comics because I wanted to know mm. more about the characters. So at that point in my life, I, uh, I I was interested in reading the comic based on my interest in the show. And so a friend of mine, Mike, uh, he he was like, I have a ton of comics. I can just you know, bring over some comic for you to read and borrow. And he, he, he dumped all this stuff on me, like uh, a bunch of Titans and Death of Superman. And so that was when I kind of started really getting into comic pretty hardcore and really finding that I really love Superman uh, mythology. So that's kind of trickled down since. But I, I think there's, you know, a couple of touch, touchstones for me with uh, Superman and probably... Uh, later Donnerverse kind of era and uh, me reading comics. I'm going to say a couple of things. Okay. One, you just said Donnerverse. Superman did the connective universe first. It did. I Super argue Girl that all the time. Connects, connects to the Superman films. Point of order there. Yeah. Number two. I agree. You noticed your friend brought you comics. Physical media, people. They yes. still have value. You can't just let people borrow your password on your digital stuff. You can't <laughs> just say, hey, here, borrow my iPad. I downloaded some stuff. No, but you can hand somebody a book or a DVD or a Blu-ray and say, hey, check this out. The best part of him giving me all those old comics uh, was that it still, you know, it had that old comic smell. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you can, mm-hmm. you can smell, like, the printed page coming off <laughs> those comics. And I always... What? Sometimes now I just I prefer opening up a, an old comic just because there's that musky comic. I miss old comics because I miss when I would open them and like there'd be advertisements for like some food item that no longer exists or like Game Genie or this arcade game and it really like sets you in the time of when it was released. Oh yeah. Now you open a comic and it's just advertising other comics. Yeah. There's no more like outer. Um, advertising in comic books anymore yeah i love the old dc comic yeah a lot of those old comics uh i noticed have like uh advertisements for workout equipment and you know trying to build your weight and i guess i don't know if they did that a lot super stuff especially but uh but i always wonder like what kid is reading this and like sent in stuff mm-hmm. to get that equipment and did he did he beef up did that kid beef up because of this so I, I always uh, enjoy looking at that because uh, it makes me wonder who's been. It makes me wonder too. <laughs> and that was like Joe Schuster's thing. It was like he always wanted to work out and he was always into like the bodybuilding and stuff. Yeah, it was a lot of bodybuilding. Um, I, I, I was, I was little... You know, it's 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 so interesting because I feel like I feel like you start out like as a Superman fan, like for us, and then like Batman's like your teenage rebellion years. Like, oh, <laughs> You know, um, and then like for me, I think I started getting more in like my Superman fandom took more of a stronger presence more than anything because I realized that I wanted to, to read the stories of the, of the and reflect the character that I felt the real world needed most. Mm-hmm. You know, like I enjoy Batman. I enjoy Batman stories and Batman movies. I like the detective angle and, you know, it's a great character, but I don't identify with the character. I, I and I mean it's not saying I'm Superman or anything, but like there's a lot of qualities in that character that I I identify with and I I love, and but I also love the hope and the aspirational. Um, I wrote a piece that appeared in the Daily Planet online about why I always wear a Superman shirt, and it was about just the idea of that symbol having this true, beautiful meaning that still reflects you know hope, aspiration, a sense of caring for all. Even right now, like it's hard to see, but like I have the my shirt is the BVS. Nice. Batman with the Superman in it. My wife got me uh, back. It was like a, it was a special preview thing before the movie came out. It's like it, it came out like 
the shirt came out like as a limited edition in 2015. Um, but so I always have one on, I mean, even have like, I have my Superman tattoo always too, but like, right. so it's just how I've kind of gotten to where I'm like, I, I like the character more, but enough about me. I talk about myself all the time. No, Let's that's how I, you. no, I, I, I agree. I do that sometimes if I, if I feel like I need a little extra courage, uh, and I need to go somewhere and do something or, uh, I remember my first day back, um, I had had, uh, surgery for my cancer that I, uh, back in, I guess and so I had done surgery recovery for weeks, and my first day back at work, I wore a Superman shirt just so I could have a little extra courage. I went back to work, kind of tried to get back to my, you know, normal routine. So I I understand that. I I I sometimes it there's something about it where it that helps feel something. It does. Um, it's kind of like that uh, reference in Fred Claus where uh, Kevin Spacey's character wears the Superman cape at the end under his suit because it helps make him feel strong. <laughs> and Santa, like, pats him on the back and everything. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I have, when I do that boost sometimes, what I do is, like, I just hear, like, some of those, like, Jonathan Kent speeches in my head. Like, he's talking to me. <laughs> That's, I'm like, yes, what am I going to do? What kind of man am I going to be? <laughs> well, Jonathan um, Kent is very wise. So That's a good person. I'm just like... Thanks, voice in my head, Jonathan Kent. <laughs> and if you haven't listened to it, uh, my friend Zach does the Always Hold On to Smallville awesome. podcast where they do like retro. I've been on there like every season since it started. Um, it's a great little like dive into how that show is carried over. You're talking about like, because I feel like for me, and I've said this before, like Smallville was important to me because that show started when I was in high school. And then it carried me through high school, college, after, and then it ended the year I got married. I got married the same month that the show ended, and they had the wedding wedding attempt of Clark and Lois on the show. Yeah, they, they didn't actually so like, get married, but they had a ceremony, I think, but it did go through. And then they tried to get married again at the end, you know, <laughs> it was a time jump. And, you know, and then now here, you know, Superman Lois is going on, and here I am now married for 10 years have children i'm a dad so now once again like superman is more relevant oh yeah and just like who i who i am connecting with that so all right so back to you favorite version of superman period so it can be a comic live action animated favorite version go uh i mean my favorite superman is the cab um i i grew up with the chris free version but I never really liked him totally. Like he 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 seemed friendly, but I was always bothered by the mind wipes. Uh, growing up, uh, I always thought Margot Kidder's Superman was a little. You know, everybody talks about oh she can't be you know the Superman because of glass. It did bother me when I was a kid growing up because I did have glasses and I always thought why why would people not recognize me if I took my glasses off? Um, and so that kind of bothered me, and I didn't like um, the way Chris Reed. Uh, Superman would uh, take memories away from Lois, and he does it twice. People, I, I think people forget about it. Oh, I don't know where Tyler went. Did Tyler go away? Have you seen Tyler? No, no. I'll, I'll go see if he's outside. But, Tyler, yeah, Tyler. yeah. See if you can go get Tyler so I can hey, finish. Oh, oh, hey, there's Tyler. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Tyler's back. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think people forget that uh, Christopher Reeve's Superman actually mind wipes Lois. White. He does it in Superman 2 and then he does it in Superman 4. And the one in Superman 4 is even worse because he does it just to make himself feel better. And so that was what I kind of grew up with uh, in Superman. And I, I just I didn't like, and I think for a long time I didn't like Superman because that I didn't like lied and then he took away our memories and all that kind of stuff. And so then when Henry Cavill's Superman came around, I had, um, I had previously, when I had gotten into comics, I was reading like the Bronze Age you know, John Byrne, Man of Steel, Death of Superman. Like, I was reading that Superman. And so when I got to Henry Cavill, I saw that Superman, that Bronze Age, Death of Superman guy, that John Byrne, Man of Steel, I saw that in Henry Cavill's Superman. And he, uh, he, he kind of corrected, his version of Superman corrected everything I didn't like about Christopher Reeve. Uh, he never lied to Lois, even when she discovered who he was. You know, he was like, I guess... I'm just going to have to hope you don't do anything crazy with my secret. 
And so he really trusted Lois and, uh, and she was much smarter. Amy Adams, Lois was much smarter. So I like that world that Henry Cavill's Superman lives in because I, I think there's something that, uh, relatable for me. You were talking about things being relatable to you. I think that first Superman is kind of relatable to me because not everything is easy. And, you know, you have to figure things out. And I like the world in it because it is reflective of our world. And that Superman would have to deal with harder things. So I don't know. I think Henry Cavill's Superman hit at the right time for me because, like I mentioned, I had gone uh, breast cancer. And that happened, like, right after Man of Steel came out. I think Man of Steel came out in June 2013. 13. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, like, very in cancer So I really uh, held on to Zack Snyder Steel and Cavill's Superman. And I listened to the soundtrack when I would go work out at the Y uh, to keep myself strong. I, I would watch it at night when I went to bed so I'd have something good to fall asleep to. So it, that, it just holds a really special place in my heart. And he just, that version of Superman just made me love to, like I liked Superman, but Henry Cavill's love him. So I, I, I think I would have I will, uh, I'll share this. I don't know if I've shared this before. I don't know. I talk a lot. So, um, when my wife and I had our second miscarriage, the birth date that they projected was going to be on the release of Man of Steel. Oh, wow. And I, I made a deal with my wife. I was like, okay, if the kid comes the day the movie comes out, you have to let me name it Clark (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and stuff. And, um, so that kind of carried, like, when we saw the movie, you know, the opening scene. And I think, you know, this is just a quick critique I've said before. Is I like the fact that Clark is born on Krypton, and he's an infant, and, like, they shortly have to send him away. Because I think it resonates as a parent a lot stronger than, like, you know, the John Byrne sending the Matrix, and he's born on Earth. Um, because that idea, like, so when my son Solomon was born... Uh, shortly to like the next day after he was born, they had him in the NICU for a while. But the first night I had him laying on my chest and he was just sleeping there. My wife was asleep. I was awake and I watched man of steel on my iPad with him on my chest. And like that opening scene, like it just, it hit me a lot harder of like, just if I had to just take my son right now off my chest and put him in something and like, um, It just, it just, it's a much stronger, but, um, I totally agree with certain things. Like you are a brave soul (laughs) because it feels like if anyone says anything about the Christopher Reeve Superman, they're like, what? No, you're wrong. Oh, I I don't have any, uh, precious things here in the super fandom. I I will, (laughs) I will critique Christopher Reeve Superman all day. I I mean, there's some good things about him, but, uh, but I'm not afraid. No, I totally agree with (laughs) Like, I don't like Margot Kidder as Lois Lane and her and Clark's relationship because she never likes Clark. Yeah. She's always mean. Now, if you were building these characters as a series where you have, like, points and you could go, but, like, just in it, like, he loves Lois, but Lois loves Superman. Right. And that's it. Like, she hates on Clark. Uh, and, you know, Christopher Reeves, Clark, people talk about, but that wasn't the Clark of the comics. Like, they started changing the comics after his to reflect the Clark that he created and it's kind of an interesting cause I feel like, you know, part of us not to stand out, but if you are that bumbling and goofy, like you're going to stand out. Like people might not think you're Superman at first, but like you're going to be on people's mind because you're just so awkward. Yeah. You're going to you know, get like, him. you're the goofiest guy around. People are going to notice you and remember you. Oh, so, but you know, I also have a grudge. In Superman 2, let's see if I remember, because I've, I've watched both cuts recently, and I'm trying to remember, but he spins the world back, right? And then he goes back to the diner and, like, beats up the guy. Uh, does, or does he beat up the guy, then spin the world back? That's what I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember, um, does, does he spin it back in Superman 2, or is that the end? Yeah. It's in both. It's in both because the problem was that the spinning the earth back was originally the ending for number two. Oh, okay. Because it was one massive script. Yeah. But when they were filming them back to back, you know, they said, hey, give us 
um, finish Superman one. So they kind of tacked on the ending. Uh, that's why if you watch the Superman two, the Richard Donner cut, the film picks up. It starts in a weird spot because it's trying to show you what the original ending for Superman one was going to be the missiles, him stopping them, throwing them into space. And then Superman one was originally supposed to end with Zod yelling free as they flew to earth. That was supposed to be the ending. Yeah. But, you know, that's why that movie starts weird. The, f- the official beginning of Superman 2, like 2, in the Richard Donner cut, is when the credits start. That's when 2 actually starts. The, the first part's him saying, hey, this is how 1 should have ended. Um, but I'm trying to remember now if it was, if it's, he beats up the guy, then spins the earth, or if he spins the earth, then goes back. and Yeah, I can't remember the, oh, I, I must be working out thing. Yeah, I can't remember the order of the, uh, I had even forgot about the, uh, spinning the world back to Superman 2, but I know he definitely uh, goes back uh, guy at the diner after he gets the powers back. That, that's all I know. Yeah, so. Which seems kind of talk, unfair. Look that up. Um, I think it would just been better if he just did, like, the, come here, sir, and, like, this guy punches him and, like, breaks his hand, you know, because he's Superman. Like, that's, but. He know, does uh, throw, him, throw him through an arcade, uh, Oh. Yeah. It's been a while so, since I've I'm trying to, watched John or Keta. I'm trying I should, to remember. Should visit it. I'm trying to remember the end of Superman 2. Because like I said, I've watched the, both versions so much that they're just they might just be bleeding in my brain. Yeah, those, they those... might have just done this. Yeah, I think it's he gives Lois the memory kiss, then goes back to the diner and messes with the dude, and then it ends. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, don't ever do a, a marathon where you watch both at the same time. It's hard. It's hard to, to keep up with them. Then, yeah, it's great when it's fresh, but then later you're like, "But oh, we're gonna keep moving on." <laughs> but um, favorite Superman-based TV show? Oh, uh, I would probably say Lois and Clark: The New Adventures of Superman, but. Justice League Universe. I don't know if that would be considered a fan base show, but I love JLU. TV. It works. But I but it, I would but I, but I would say Lois and Clark. Works for me. Uh, wait, I love Do you want I me to explain one. it or the one of the fast? Oh, questions. go ahead. No. Uh well no, I just I really like um the the way that they utilized a different approach. It wasn't just like a like a Superman show. It was a it was a romance. It was the show was based on the romance rom-com. of Lois. Yeah, it was a rom com uh, of Lois and Clark. And it was originally supposed to be a Lois Lane show. It was supposed to be called uh, one I know. It was but it was originally um, supposed to be Lois Lane's Daily Planet. And uh, hmm. for some reason, they didn't want to go with that. So I guess they had to have Superman there. Uh, but I loved Harry Hatcher's Lois Lane. Dean Kane probably is my favorite Clark Kent. Uh, and I just, uh, I just love that show. It, it, some of it's a little ridiculous. I'll admit that, but, but, uh, but I think it's just a really enjoyable show. I, I, I it's kind of comfort food uh, to me when I watch. It. I, I just want to feel snugly inside. I'll watch Lois and Clark the new event Superman because so. No, it's I, a little comforting. It's, it is, and I, my wife and I like did a rewatch two years, three years ago. We we moved into our house, and we hadn't had the internet up, or everything was still unpacking. And I just had my DVD set. We just put it in, just started like, you know, watching and going through it. And I was like, it is just comforting. Like, it's just a different way they made TV. I mean, Dean Cain's Superman is the first post-crisis Superman. Yeah, it's true. Do you know John Shea is Lex Luthor is the first post-crisis Lex Luthor, um, and. I learned some things about Lois and Clark from my friend Sam Rizzo. You know Sam. Um, I think I know I the name, was, uh, but I, I haven't really. He was in. It. He was in our chat. Yeah. Um, he popped in and said, "Hey." Um, he was talking about how one of the things that led to Lois and Clark being birthed was because it had to do with the rights with Superman character and everything, and how Superboy had kept getting popular. But DC Warner had, like, no real cut of the profits. It was a Viacom, Paramount, Salkine thing. Oh, yeah. And so right. what they did was they used some sort of, like, 
they weren't approving scripts. They used some legal t- loophole type stuff that got that show shut down. And then that's why there's this small gap from when that ended to and when then the Superboy. Lois and Clark premieres oh. is because Superboy ended. And then like within a year, two or I have to look at my dates for sure, but like Lois and Clark's on the air. Yeah. And that was more DC produced. They were getting Warner Brothers getting their cut of a Superman based show. And that's what helped birth, uh, you know, the whole Lois and Clark thing. And, you know, it's funny because to me, I had Christopher Reeve Superman, but Dean Cain was more of my childhood Superman because it was harder to find uh, home media of the Chris films. I had, I think I had a TV dubbed, you know, VHS of the first two together because I always forgot, like when I was younger, what happened and what I thought it was all one movie because I remember, oh, the Kryptonians at the beginning and then this. But then when I got older and I watched it, I could, oh, it's two different films. And it always seemed like Superman 4 was on TV constantly. It had to be like <laughs> super cheap to broadcast because um, I felt like every time I was at my grandparents' house, it was on like the local TV station or whatever. So I had that, but like the Superman, like I tuned in to watch, you know, like was the Dean Cain Superman because it was on Sunday nights. And that's just what you did. Yeah. You watched. Um, so that was a big, and then of course, the animated series came along, and everything. All right. So you've kind of already said this, but we're going to tweak it a little bit. Favorite version of Clark Kent? Uh, I mean, pro- I mean, probably the Dean Cain uh, from Lois and Clark. That, and um, I, I like Tom Welling Clark Kent. I think, especially in those early seasons. I think he did a really good job showing the awkwardness teenage side of Clark where he have frustrations about, you know, being able to do certain things, powers, being able to fit in. I thought he did all of that really well. I had problems with him as he grew older. Uh, but uh, but I thought in those, like, first five seasons, I think Tom Welling did a really good job with Clark Kent. And that's really, he signed on to be Clark Kent. So, uh, so I, I like his Clark Kent, but I think Dean Cain for me is, uh, his, his Clark was just so likable. And I, I found that, uh, what I liked about him was that he did a lot of investigating with Lois and he was Superman sometimes, but he, I think helped the people of Metropolis more as Clark than he did as Superman, Mm -hmm. uh, just by way of journalism and being a good reporter and looking out for the the little people. That's what I love about Lois Clark, the show in general. The characters uh, cared about. And so I think for me, I'd probably say I, I can agree with that. This isn't me talking, but I'm pretty close to Dean Cain. I have an argument for Tyler. Based oh, yeah. No, well. he's, like he's, he's a good Clark. Yeah. What I, I like, because I really liked his Clark. I mean... So 2016, you know, you have BVS coming out. I think it had just come out. And then we had that trailer for Supergirl season two. And I remember literally watching the trailer that has the the shirt rip scene of him. of And I just, of Tyler just running and doing the shirt rip. And I just remember like having chills. And I'm like, wow. And then like his first on period where he's like talking to Mr. White and he's like, G. Williger, yes, yes, look at he split. He's like, I know that no one says look at he split anymore, sir. And he's like, and then when he walks in and just, it got me. And I was like, wow. And then he's just been able to evolve that. And I think he's he's got the Clark and the Superman down and he continues to. Um, but I really like what he does with Clark. And I like Tom Welling's Clark, but Smallville's weird <laughs> because because Superman Returns kind of jacked it all up. A little bit. Because if you if you look at Smallville, especially in a retrospective, they were doing their own thing, had their own mythology. But then all of a sudden, right, as Superman Returns starts to come out, they inject so much of the classic Donner versus Superman stuff into there and start to change it up and go some that way and try to make, like, they start in, introducing more higher level Superman concepts and villains because if you look at Smallville, you have the high school years, the first four years. That's your first volume, your first major chapter. Then you have the college, 
as my friend Zach calls it, the college dropout years. <laughs> yeah, because you know, he didn't five, really go six, to college. Seven. And then you have the Metropolis years, which are eight, nine, and ten. Which eight, nine, ten is really when it's more of just a Superman show, but they don't want to be Superman as much because um, he's in Metropolis. He's the Blur, and you know, I am. The more I think about it, the more I get, you know, Clark and Superman are one person. Mm -hmm. There's not these three distinctive things. I hate when people try to say, "Well, there's Clark, there's Kal El, there's Superman." No. Kal El is just the name that his Kryptonian heritage had. Right. But he is who he is. He's a person. And it's like if you look at this as a person, when he's Superman, he's a little bit more this way. You know, he projects himself a little bit more. He's still himself. Just like, you know, when you go to work, you're still you, but sometimes you have to put on a little bit of a show. Yeah. You know? And then when you come home, you know, you're still you, but maybe in a bad mood, you're a little bit more of a grump. You're a little bit more in a pain. Yeah. But you're still you. And it's like if this is him, Superman's over here, and then maybe – when he's Clark, he's a little bit more like this when he's got the glasses because he's just just enough of the gauge to kind of be a little different. But also, I mean, in most of the times, Superman doesn't always interact with the same people that Clark Kent interacts with, except for like Lois Lane, who you know now knows who he is, so right. he doesn't have to. You know, maybe Jimmy Olsen, but I'm not. I'm not really into the whole. He's like these different. No, that's not him. That's Batman. Yeah. Okay, that, that's Batman's. <laughs> that's that, that's Batman's shtick. Um, Clark is just who he is. He's a person. He just has a different name. Like, you know, I'm Tyler, but Tyler's my middle name. But when I go out and I have to do something professional or serious, they're like, "Oh, Jonathan," because that's my first name. You know, I'm still the same person, but you're just calling me a different name. Yeah. So my my kids call me Dad. I'm the same person, <laughs> just I have a different label. Right. 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 Uh, all right, so we'll change this question up. If you could have one Superman slash Supergirl slash Kryptonian power, just one of them, what would it be? Oh, um, hmm. that's tough because uh, I mean, flight's obviously always the the obvious answer to go different places. Um, but I also have a little bit of a fear of heights. Not not completely debilitating, but I do have a fear. So. I don't know. I'm kind of like Clark Kent from Smallville in those early years. He had a he had a little bit of fear of height, uh, fly or jump very much. Uh, no, I I really like heat vision, but I don't know that I would use it for much. Uh, I think it's a cool. It's much a properly. It's it's a cool. It's a really cool power, but I would be afraid of the uh, the consequences of heat vision. I would probably burn parts of my body off. Uh, or, or I would burn a house down or something. Um, I guess... Uh, so many times I wish I could just, like, use heat vision on somebody or something, like... Yeah, it's a, a heat vision is so dangerous. Um, I guess um, invincibility, maybe? Um, I, don't, I don't know if, um, if invincibility also, like, would prevent things like cancer <laughs> or, like, super healing or something like that. Um, but I like the idea of... Um, invincibility because then then you wouldn't have to worry so much about like not, some, i i work at a university and so sometimes i'm worried that the college students don't really know how to drive are going to hit me while i'm across the street you know it would be kind yeah. of nice to be able to uh go about your day and not worry if you're going to get shot or hit by a car or something like that um or it, even if you you know uh crashed in an airplane god forbid you could you know hit the ground fine oh uh, so I, I guess I would probably say invincibility. That's probably a more of a practice. See, mine comes down to I feel like flight would be almost worthless without the invincibility. Oh, because true. Because like the friction, you know what I'm saying? Unless yeah. you have like some sort of special thing. Like, I mean, the Flash has the speed force, you know, so it's supposed to be like the energy protects him and all right. that stuff and for the friction. So I'm like, if I didn't have the invincibility, like it'd be like. Yeah, it kind of goes together. Fire. Um, but I think. You know, the strength would be a big one, but then I thought like I'd screw something up. So, like, the invincibility, I think, is where I kind of lean towards, too, because, of, like you said, the, just the daily stuff can come in handy. I wouldn't be as afraid of anything. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, Although, uh, right. Su Superman also does have a power that not a lot of people talk about, uh, super ventriloquism. Which would be kind of fun <laughs> to play with. Uh, you could like throw or the shooting out many versions of yourself from your hand. Yes, yes, that that could come in handy. 
uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, some of those wackier, you know, uh, powers might be worth hearing. That'd be kind of cool. Like, what are you doing, Tyler? Just watch. I'll help you clean the house. <laughs> um, okay. So favorite Superman storyline. Ooh, are we talking? Supergirl. They kind of go hand in hand. This so. comics, TV shows. Either. All of it. You know, if you have one and one, which I mean, if you have a comic you want us to talk about, if you have a TV show, like, uh, um, well, the death of yeah. two. I mean, I I hate to sound like uh something that everybody probably always says, but the death of Superman comic storyline was the thing that really made me love comic, uh, because there is a part in I don't know if it's the death of Superman or the return of Superman. Uh, but there's a moment where Lex Luthor goes down into the area where Superman often is burial site, and he's frustrated that he was not killed. Slams yep. his fist down on the coffin, and it cuts to the panel cuts to someone trying to resuscitate Jonathan Kent at a heart attack, and that was I I loved that panel so much because it it sort of opened my mind to what comics could be it wasn't just comics are just pretty pictures that sort of illustrate what's happened it's like no they're like cinematic story they're um they're telling you the action and, and i could kind of I, i'm a very visual person and i'm also a video mm-hmm. editor by trade um so so to see it in that way for, that was the first time i had read a comic where it was presented in such a way that i could see it playing out like it's the film and I just I loved that. So that that and that storyline also made me appreciate Lois Lane kind of for the first time in my life because she was smart and she um, was not someone you know that uh, kind of uh, fooled by a lot of things. She was trying to figure out who the real Superman was. Uh, I really liked that. So I I, I guess that's the the one storyline that really sticked out to me is like having an impact on my life. Um, but, and not in a real profound way, but like in in my life of reading comics, I guess, and kind of my fan, uh, because it showed me that comics were just awesome. I think you know the death storyline. I always I joke often how I'm like it seems like the only important story with Superman is like the death. And that's what uh, like the biggest everyone wants to jump to, but I, it also goes to show you that that how big he is that when he's gone, the absence of that just sucks so much. Um, you know, I remember the first time I read the whole death thing, like I read it in sections and now I just have like one giant thick, um, the funeral for the, for, for a friend part, like that whole where he's, it's just like people reflecting on him gone, especially the Bibbo stuff. Yeah. Um, got me. And Bibbo is a character I hope that might appear like in Superman and Lois, like a flashback they're in Metropolis or they go back to Metropolis for something like that would be kind of cool. Yeah, that would be awesome. And I guess if I, if I can mention a Supergirl story, uh, my favorite Supergirl comic story is uh, Bizarro Girl by Sterling Gates. Kind of had a, a mm. run there. And uh, his, his Bizarro Girl story is my favorite because it uh, shows Supergirl connecting to Bizarro Girl on a, on a personal level and not seeing Bizarro Girl as a, a strange, a strange creature. She sees her as a, you know, a, a, you know, someone who is like her help. And uh, she you know, takes her back to Bizarro World. It's just, it's such a great story that showcases uh, Supergirl's passion. And so that one I like, uh, I uphold as one of the great all time but then I would also probably point you to uh, Peter David's Supergirl run, which is a whack, crazy version of Supergirl. It's the, the, it's the Linda Danvers Matrix Supergirl, where uh, basically Linda Danvers mixed together with like, um, well, it's the Matrix protoplasm, and then it's yep. combined with Linda Danvers, who is actually a story, like a satanic cult member, which is kind of wild. But uh, but I, yep. I, I love that story because it actually... If you read it all in one thing, it, it does a pretty got, good job. Sometimes comics sometimes don't do a good job of, like, connecting everything. And so you read it and you're like, did I miss an issue? I don't know what, I don't know what mm-hmm. to do. Um, but the Peter David run actually is a really good, uh, it's a long story, but uh, but it, it does a good job of connecting 
all the storyline characters. It has a really wonderful art, and the story is very mature in the way it's told in terms of like storytelling. So I, I would probably um, say Sterling Gates, Sorrow Girl. And- well, that, that's awesome because that kind of uh, takes my next question. <laughs> So we'll just chuck that out because she's pretty much answered it. But like, <laughs> the different storylines, you know, that super, because I mean, she's had a very convoluted history of, because of, you know, post-crisis and everything and the pre-crisis, you know, she's Kara zor the cousin. And then uh, she's, like you said, the, the Matrix uh, proto- protoplasm con- thing. And that is uh, interesting because I remember the first time I, read a comic with that and I was like what is this Cause I, like, it was it was just a random it was like right when she was dying or something I just remember like I had Superman on the cover but he was like in black and purple and it was like the the I've been trying to find that issue forever it was like, action comics I believe okay I should probably look it up on DC Universe I'm an idiot um and like she took the form like she's on the Kent farm and like the, the form if I find it I'll send you the number yeah yeah uh, what it is I just remember reading, like, what is this? Um, yeah, Supergirl really actually has a, a long history, and I, I think it's an underrated comic book history. She, you know, comes in in the Silver Age, and a lot of those stories are kind of the same thing. You have, like, three scenarios and stories that were... Uh, but it gets a little more um, sophisticated as time goes on. And get into the 70s and 80s era, uh, they let Supergirl grow up a little more, which is cool. She goes to college, and gets a job. She's a camera operator at a local TV station, so I can identify with her that way. Uh, I was a, uh, a I worked so it was kind of fun to see the Supergirl did that as well. So I, I really like the era of the, the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Sorry, I'm picking on my wife because she she made me some tea because she's awesome, but she put nice. it in a Darth Vader mug. And I'm oh. like, how are you going to put it in my Darth Vader mug when I'm recording a Superman <laughs> podcast? needs to be themed. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Oh, this tea is great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, she got this new tea she wanted me to try. Nice. So I'm just picking on her. Tea is good um, for you. It is. So I agree because, you know, my, okay, so my big thing with Supergirl and Superman that's never been explored, I don't want to like toot my own horn here, but I actually was working on writing a story because I feel like they've never touched on the story of the brothers L. Oh, yeah. Like you have Jor-El and you have Zoro, but they never talk about them. Like what's their relationship? What's their history? Um, I think there's a really strong story there. And so not to like get, you know, back into my, but I have a story that I've worked on. And I'm not going to give too much away because I wrote it uh, because, okay, like I said to you, my first name is Jonathan, and I'm the oldest brother. I have dark hair. My wife has dark hair. My brother is younger. His name is Zach. So it starts with a Z. We have a J. He's the younger. He has – he had his kids first. And they his wife, he is blonde. His wife is blonde. His children are blonde, you know. You cannot, like, not see some parallels going on here. <laughs> Very simple. And so I, started, so I started writing this story, and, like, I won't get all the details, but I like the idea that something happens with these brothers, and they used to be close, and they basically become adversaries. And, and at the end, when the planet's destroyed, the only hope that they have for their family and a way for them to carry on is, you know, Jarrell sends Clark, or I'm sorry, Cal, I get my terms right. And Zorel's like, it should have been my responsibility to make men's with my brother, but now like it falls to you. Watch over your cousin, heal our family, and he sends Kara, you know, yeah. to take care of her 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 baby cousin. You know, like the idea that we failed, I failed, my brother failed. If we were united as a family, maybe we could have you know helped our planet. But you know, fix our family. So it's it's there's That's a lot a to story. it that I've worked on. Yeah, there's there's a lot to it that I've worked on because I use you know the parallel started with just mine and my brother's relationship and where we are now compared to how we used to be. But yeah, I just feel like not like I have to write, but I feel like there's a story there of these two men who have children who both survived this devastation. What was what's their story? So 
Yeah, uh, DC Comics um, actually has some really cool uh, old Krypton stories that I'm trying to. Uh, I think there's, there's some um, uh, Phantom Zone stories. So I've been trying to read through some of those old uh, Krypton stories. I, they do open up the world. I I had to write my own backstory for Krypton uh, just because that's like me as a writer. I told my wife, I said, um, my problem is always they talk about Krypton. I'm like, what if Krypton had a massive civil war? Hmm. And it got to the point where they turn into, they use biological weapons and everything. And they just, they like, it damaged their planet. But all that remained was like three cities worth of people. So there's only like a couple million people left on this entire planet. And that's kind of why you can start to get to the point where even though there's people, like you might have these families that everybody knows because the planet is not that big. Yeah. Because they, they wiped out most of their civilization already. And I wrote a whole history kind of thing. And I filtered that into my story because, of course, you got to write some backstory to write your story. Cool. Um, now I'm just talking to myself. Yeah, that sounds awesome. But favorite super favorite super film. So animated, live action, Superman or Supergirl. Go. Uh, can it be Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice? If there's Batman yes, in it, it can. okay. So that would probably that that it's got Superman in it. Yeah. So that would be, and I I would argue that maybe it's more of a super random film, but uh, but you could argue it both ways. Uh, that that one's like my favorite. Uh, it's it's my favorite version of Superman and my favorite story that they were telling. Um, and I think also just a phenomenal film. Uh, I, I always call it a cinem- cinematic masterpiece, and people are always like, "What are you? What are you talking about?" I'm like, "Yes, it is." Uh, so I <laughs> people push back on that with me, but I I think it's one of the best people songs. suck ever made but uh but i but i like that film for superman because he you know he he struggles a little bit with trying to figure out his place as superman with the people by the end of that film the people have embraced and see him as as the the symbol of hope that they uh you know that superman is in everyone you know, i guess the zeitgeist of people in the real world we always think that superman is supposed to be the beacon of hope and I think by the end of that film, Henry Cavill's Superman does get there, even if it's in death. But I love that ending where um, there's a like a vigil at, uh, at Heroes mm-hmm. Park, and it says "Seek His Monument Ground." And I love the idea of that because, and that's a real thing too. It's from uh, oh, what is I used to know that by by heart, but it's um it's a real it's a real thing. I think in St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, it seek monument, and, and it'll find it. But it, if you seek his monument, look around. Actual, uh, it's an actual thing that's described in that April. Um, that's where they they got it. But I, I like the idea of that for Superman because the idea that people in Metropolis etched that themselves, like it wasn't something that was mm-hmm. you know built into that shrine. It was someone wrote it on there. And I like the idea of people of Metropolis. You know, think to themselves, well, he's not here anymore, but if you want Superman to be here, you can be Superman to each other. You know, we can be Superman mm-hmm. to each other. And I just think about that uh, a lot in the real world. Like, if I if I want to see the values of Superman or Supergirl in the real world, I've got to invite those myself and be Supergirl to someone else that I encounter. And so I like the message of that with uh, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, because it, it, to me, it's quite inspiring <laughs> a lot of people say that that film is dark and gritty and gloomy and i'm like this is the most inspiring film i've ever seen in my life so uh so i think that um just based around the idea of what superman become at the end of that i always have the point that like if i was to do a superman film i think you have to kind of show the world a little darker but you got to make Superman the light Mm. because like in the first film, like you got to make him like his inspiration is what elevates other people. It's what changes things. Um, You know, the whole idea is that he brings the hope and it's like, how does that affect and ripple and everything? And I think, you know, that's kind of part of the, what they were going for is like showing like what the world was and then what Superman can make it. And I think my favorite artist. 
Uh, oh, go ahead. I was, just, I was just gonna say that uh, Man of Steel does that pretty well too, uh, with the scene with Harry holding Jenny's hand uh, when they think they're all gonna die, and that's kind of yep. interspersed with Superman fighting the world engine. So I, I think that's really wonderful to show that human beings were having to be Superman for each other in that moment. They thought that was it. So just a simple handhold uh, of somebody scared. That, that's that's I think that job. Uh, I uh I was bummed that Lombard wasn't in BBS. Just throwing that out there. Like it kinda of bummed <laughs> me out. But yeah, it was good to see him. Like, where did he go? Live back. At least we got yeah, him. I was up. like I was like and then there's like one part in Man of Steel that bothers me. And it's like some of the smallest parts. You know what it is? Is when he's fighting on the street and Zod kicks the truck and he like jumps and like yeah. glides between it. It looks awesome, but that truck just goes behind him and blows up and then blow, the building just starts yeah. to collapse. He, he maybe like, could have you stopped it or you could have stopped that truck, man. Yeah. Like yeah. I understood it looked awesome, but you could have stopped that truck. No, I agree. I, just I agree. Pick on uh, it's um, his like first so, day as people. <laughs> He's, figured like, he's like, look, man, I'm getting beat up, like, <laughs> by s- of someone I thought could be family, okay? Chill, chill out, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Superman dude, artist or, or yeah. favorite Supergirl artist? Um, yep. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm more familiar with the uh, Supergirl one just because I read more Supergirl sure. art. Um, so I like... Um, uh, Carnero, I forget what her first name is. Uh, Carnero, uh, uh, Lupacina, uh, Emanuela Lupacina, I think is the name. Um, but they, they do a really good job, um, like drawing to hair. It's really important. Um, I think also, uh, Bil- Bilky Evely, I think, Bilpus or Bilky, I, I, I need to remember how to pronounce her name. Um, but she's, she's drawing. with names. She's drawing the um, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, uh, the Tom King run mm. currently. And that art yeah. is just like, it's beautiful. You could frame that and put it up on your wall and people would think it was like some, you know, uh, fancy pants artist from some fancy pants gallery. It's just so beautiful. Every every panel in those books is gorgeous. Coloring. Um so I, I think probably those three Super Bowl artists um, would probably, I wish I had their full names. Uh, their names are escaping my brain, but uh, but uh, I want to say Carnero has the first, but Carmen, I think, Carmen Carnero and Emanuela Lupacino. Nice. Now, what is your favorite? Supergirl costume, like in the comics. Oh, that's tough because she does because go through a lot of iteration. <laughs> I, I'll just throw this out there. I absolutely hate the one where it was in like the two early two thousands, where it's like almost looks like a top, a crop top with like the really short skirt that's really flowy. I hate that. Just saying that. It was that the the white top with the blue skirt. That when- one's. On my okay-ish, it's, uh, if I could find one, it's like, I think it's the same one that she had at the, uh, the Apocalypse when they did, I can't remember what the, I think I kind of know what you're talking, oh, I, yeah, no, that might have been the David Turner version, maybe, uh, yeah, I would agree with that, anything that showed her midriff, I was not a very, uh, fond of, uh, and I definitely did this not like a, this the This is new- a nicer version. Oh, yes, but yes, 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 it. I think that's the, the. The, yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. Not a big fan of the new Fifty Two. Um, I like some the of the way. Fifty Two was just kind of weird. Yeah, I, I really, weird. I really don't like the uh, the way it draws into her bottom area. Not real crazy yep. about that. Uh, definitely, oh, oh, I can definitely tell you that I would not create that cost design. Um, I don't know. I really I totally lo- agree with you. Yeah, I, I like the rebirth stuff totally because agree. they were trying to kind of pull the rebirth look into um, Supergirl TV series on WS. Job trying to adapt that. Uh, the the Silver Age is really interesting because a lot of times she actually has like like a full blue uh, suit, like the blue top with the shirt. Uh, 
Uh, that's which, my favorite. That's my the superhero girls. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good super. version. I like her shoes in that. My daughter, my daughter loves that, and that's the costumes that she has. Yeah, I mean, she's had a lot of costumes. She's had like the short shorts with the the blue shirt, the S shield like on one side of her chest. Um, had a uh, think different iteration. I'm not crazy about the Linda Danvers look. Uh, so probably either the Silver Age or the, the Rebirth era would probably be my favorite. I can, I can really agree with you on those. Like, I just, I know it's comics, but at the same time, you don't have to, like, draw her, like, over-sexualized. But yeah, that happened a lot in the cool. early 2000s. Um, like... Like this artwork right here we're talking about is like breathtakingly awesome. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you for as the TV version, skirt or the pants? Which costume do you like better? I I prefer just visually the skirt because it's more of a, a classic supergirl look. Uh but the, I, I understand the arguments for the pants, uh especially just logistic logist- for the show for Canada, it gets very cold, so Melissa acts uh asked her pants uh, just so she would hold anymore um and also the pants kind of you know if it was a real thing would want to crawl flying up the air and everyone seeing up her skirt uh so i get i get the arguments for the pants i've gotten used to the pants over the years um but just like visually uh for me i think skirt is more of a super girl look and not just because it's a, a skirt because the history of the girl and um, yeah. Kind of what separates her makes a little different from Superman. Nowadays, with the pants, especially on the show, she's basically just, you know, Superman with long blonde hair. So I, I personally like it. You know, I like that on the show, they gave her the higher boots and the tights under the boots. I thought that was great choices um, for costuming. And I always thought if you did like a film, like it'd be kind of neat to start out with like her looking the same kind of pants costume as Superman, but then she like she tears it or whatever and makes a skirt because she makes it look more Earth Earth. Oh, style, so you would you have know? her go the opposite like, way of the TV show. Interesting. Yeah, just just to do it like something where because like, I mean, if you look at like Man of Steel, how they all had kind of that under yeah. uh, suit, you know, even Feora had it. We saw and everything. So the idea that Kara would have the same and then like she decides to she's gonna change it up and make it a little bit more earth like, I think would be kinda cool. Yeah, I think um, especially for that universe it, that would make it would be fun just to play with, but because uh, I get what you're saying and like I understand the, the points with the, the pants as well. So it's uh it's one of those things because you know, when the show was coming out, we my friend and I had the argument of like are they going to tie it to Superman? Like, is he going to be mentioned? Or are they just going to do a Supergirl show where there's kind of, she is kind of the Superman, you know, like there has never been Superman or whatever. Um, so it's kind of always that that balancing act of, because I think her story has a lot more resonance with the fact that she was older. She has the Kryptonian heritage, the history she remembers. You know, there's a lot more, like, um, I thought the New 52 did a cool job when they were doing, like, the idea of her becoming a Red Lantern because she has this anger and this rage in her for her planet and the, everything that she lost. You know, Clark has a sorrow about it, but he's never known it. He's had a good life on Earth. Yeah, that's like All one right, of so the here, big differences. Here's the quick questions without thinking about it too much. Are you ready? Sure. Tr- Superman, trunks or no trunks? No trunks. All right, let's see. I, like I don't, I don't even have like to think it. about it. <laughs> what I've come to just my rationale is if you want to put them on him in the comics, mm-hmm. fine. But live action, it just, they made him work with Brandon Routh in crisis. They also didn't shoot him that much full body. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, around other people, but in all reality, I understand the concept. I listened to you guys' argument. I wanted to jump in. The panel, of course, it was pre-recorded afterwards and everything, so, or post-recorded, whatever. But I understand it, what people are saying. But they just, I understand they break up the suit, but they just don't work anymore. Yeah, um, I, I don't think that, uh, I think you have to have a justification for it. So, yeah. 
You do. You do. <laughs> the Kents, alive or dead in the comics? Do, do I prefer them to be alive or dead? How, how, yep. Yeah, how would you want them? Alive or dead? Oh, I'm not supposed to think about this real hard. Uh, I think I... It's okay. I think I like it when there's at least one of them alive. So I would probably say alive. See, I would always, I always say that, but then the more I've thought about it, I like the idea that they're both alive. Yeah. I like the idea that I think you could make some really cool, like I've seen memes and stuff, but having just Ma and Pa almost be the family, the mom and dad to all the Justice League. Yeah. Like that kind of extension. Um, like there was a great thing where it was like a Mother's Day thing and it was Martha like – Hugging Bruce, like, like kind of come here, you know, like, um, because I think Superman doesn't have to be birthed from tragedy. The tragedy was not his tragedy that fell on him. He was an infant. That's like the tragedy of his parents. Um, he does what he does because it's the right thing to do. You know, I know there's a great dramatic story with like his father dying and he can't help him or, you know, all that. Um, but I think the idea that he has both his parents, like in Lois and Clark, because there's some great stuff with both his parents in there. And the idea that he just does what he does because it's the right thing to do. He doesn't have to have this dark, like, side that every superhero seems to have to have. Like, if someone has to die, you know? So I, I like the idea of the kids being alive. Yeah, I, I, I also would echo your uh, love for the fact that Kent sometimes family for other justice members. They, they play that up a little bit in just Unlimited. Uh, Kara in the DCAU or Kara really on the, the animated uh, she, she lives with the kids and Martian Manhunter has interaction. Uh, I, I do enjoy that. They serve you know, family of parental You know one of my favorite episodes is um we watch, me and the kids watch every year. It's the comfort and joy oh, yeah. episode of Justice League Unlimited. And when Clark comes home with Martian Manhunter and Martha's like, well, I always knitted a couple of extra. <laughs> you know, and he puts on the sweater. And even her in the recent Superman Man of Tomorrow animated film, the way they interact with John, like he can, what's the line from her? Like he can stay, like we'll set up the sheets or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I just I like that vibe from them of being like just their parents, but they they'll parent to anybody who comes yeah. around. So so now this gets to be a little bit more towards you. Um, so tell me why Supergirl Radio? What was the spark? You know what 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 was your catalyst? I mean, you know my my quick story is um, I was doing a Gotham podcast. Supergirl was announced. Krypton was announced. And I was like, I want to do Supergirl. And then, it, like, from there, I was like, you know what? I want to do more than that. I just want to talk about Superman, Supergirl, Krypton. I want to talk about it all. So I just kind of, you know, took that and made it into the show. But what, what was your start? Why did you want to do this and the way you do it and everything? Yeah, it's a little bit of a long story. I'll try to condense it down. Um, so Once Upon a Time was a TV it's show. It's a podcast. <laughs> we can do it as long as we want to. Uh, so Once Upon a Time was airing on ABC, a show about fairy tales. Disney thing. And uh, so I was doing, I, yeah, for the first couple of seasons, I really loved it. Uh, so I was doing a podcast about Once Upon a Time with my friend. And uh, around season three, I kind of fell out of love with it. I didn't like the way, you know, the direction the show was going. And during that time, I was also diagnosed with breast cancer. So I, I just kind of determined, I don't like the show anymore. I'm going through a really hard thing. I think I'm going to stop the podcast. So I stopped that show didn't uh didn't uh continue the podcast we ended the podcast and so i went through my cancer treatment did a year of that and uh then after that i came out of that around january or i guess it was before that i guess it was like november 2014 i guess um uh my friend andy who i had met andy the back of the flash podcast he um had been a guest of mine on once upon a time my once upon a time podcast so I'd gotten to know him that way. And during that time when we talked for that episode of, of that podcast, uh, we had talked about DC Comics stuff. And so he knew I was a 
a DC fan and he had been wanting to start another podcast and kind of create a network, which is now the TV podcast network. And he remembered me and that conversation. And so he approached me one day and he said, Hey, I'm thinking about starting Supergirl podcast. I want to be a part of it. And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of wanted to stop podcasting, but after about a year of not doing a podcast, I had kind of missed it. Um, and so I was like, you know, maybe I can jump back into that. And, uh, and it, maybe, maybe it'll help me feel a little more. And it did eventually. Um, because when you're going through cancer treatment, you kind of feel a little weird, like your life is not the same. Um, so it was really that initial, like, hey, do you want to do a Supergirl podcast to help start it? And uh, and I had always loved Supergirl. I, like I mentioned, I had grown up watching the Hell Slater movie. I had seen Laura Vandervoort on Smallville. I'd watched the animated series. So I was I was really familiar with the character. And uh, so that was kind of the initial spark. And then I had uh, kind of tried to find a co-host. We found another uh, another lady who would want to do it with me named Risa, and she did it for about a year, and she decided she needed to move on. So then I found uh, two other co-hosts, uh, my friend Morgan and uh, Carly Lane, and uh, so Morgan had been a guest on the uh, first couple of episodes. We talked about Smallville together. We had watched Smallville and kind of watched it while it was airing. So we had uh, gone back a long time. So anyway, uh, I guess long story short, um, Carly eventually had to leave as well, but, uh, Morgan's been with me, um, since season one. And, uh, so we just have a ton of fun together and we, we talk about the show, but we also talk about comic, uh, talk about the Helen Slater movies. So we talk about all kinds of things. We, we just love to get together and talk about Supergirl and, uh, having a good time. Uh, within the last year and a half, we start live streaming. we that's been so great for us in a way that we can engage our listeners in a, a new way uh, that I think they enjoy get together like mm-hmm. that. And so it's been a, it's been a fun way to uh, talk about the character of Supergirl. Not just, it's not just me reading the comic, even though I like to do that on my own time, but I get to have discussions about it. Here are other perspectives. That's been really fun for me because I think over the course of Supergirl radio over the last six years and, I think the last episode we did was like episode 133. We've done a lot of episodes so far. Um, and so I think over the course of that time, I started out as kind of like, yeah, I like Supergirl, but now I love Supergirl. The more I dig into it, I've, I've, I did a whole project where I tried to read from the beginning of uh, Action Comics number 252, try to read from there on up history. I'm kind of now in the, the do get that. Um, but I have really found a love for the character of Supergirl that I didn't have before because of the podcast, because I've been learned so much last time. So uh, Supergirl Radio is one of those things where I look back at it now and I think I had a hesitancy before about doing a podcast. Now I can't even remember what my life was like before it. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was thinking about that the other, other day. I was like, what did I do before we did this? Like, what was I doing? What was my life like? I don't even remember. It's such a big part of my life now. Um, so, yeah, we just have such a good time. Supergirl is now one of my all time. That's awesome. I, lo- I like that story. Um, I like how you, you know, you have your friends, you build it up. And so the next part is with this show coming to an end, what, what's the plan? Like, where's Supergirl Radio going to go? Because I, I hate the thought of, like, losing it, like, you know, like, and hearing you out there doing your Supergirl wing. So what's uh, what's the plan when the show closes out? Yeah, that's a lot of question, uh, questions. That, uh, the question that a lot of people had for us, <laughs> actually, because when the She's show... Like, shut up, Tyler. No, no, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great question because I have a good answer, I think, for you. Uh, when it was announced the show was ending, it actually, they announced the end of the show on... Girls' uh, comic book birthday, <laughs> which was very nice. Um, but uh, people, I think we, we got a couple of people, you know, messaging us saying, "Oh, I'm so sad because this means the end of Supergirl Radio." And we were like, "Hi, why? Why do we have to end it? We don't have to end it. We can keep going." Um, so I think what we're gonna do when it ends is we're gonna uh, try to get as many interviews with the cast and the crew that we can of the show, so that we can. We started 
sort of documenting some of the show history of the actors already. And so I think once the show ends, we'll be able to get more of those people because then they don't have to like be coy about it. You know, yeah. These things. Once the show ends, oh, they can it tell was us. Great. It was great working with that person. Yeah. That person was a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After the show's over, they can say whatever they want to. Um, so I think that's what we're going to try to start doing uh, mostly. Um, but we, I mean, there's, I mean, Supergirl's been in the comics. 1959. So we have a lot of Supergirl content to cover that we haven't been able to get through. Um, so we could potentially podcast for decades <laughs> about Supergirl. Um, so uh, so that's kind of where where we are. We're gonna we're gonna do interviews, uh, probably do some comic book stuff, and then also just some fun stuff. We we started doing these Supergirl radio game nights because game night on the TV series our big thing the super friends get together and they play game game night so uh we we like to get together with some other podcasts you know, and play games uh, over That's over awesome. Streamyard. so we'll probably do a little bit more of that because the, the fun so it's it's kind of whatever we want to do um but uh but my policy is always whatever we do for an episode of supergirl radio it has to tie into supergirl it has to have sort of supergirl connection or uh, something uh, Supergirl sent because uh, I I used to listen to uh, Kevin Smith's uh, it used to be called Batman on Batman. Thank you. And Thank I you. and I I'm used gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna high five you right now. Come on, two right. Let's do this, bam. Because uh, yeah. I know where you're going with this. I know where you're going. Keep going. Keep going. I sister, I, I I used to love his Batman on Batman podcast because he would have Batman actors and you know he would read some of the comics and I, I just it was it was great. And then all of a sudden it became like a marvel cinematic news hour and he would talk about the marvel mm-hmm. stuff and i was like this this has nothing to do with batman and of course now it's kind of uh evolved into this um i, I don't know what he calls it now but it, it's not necessarily just batman in the name anymore. but but uh but i never want supergirl radio to turn into that i don't want it to be like oh i come to supergirl radio but you're going to be talking about black widow like that doesn't make any sense so yeah. uh so i want i want if people come to Supergirl Radio, they're always going to get something about Supergirl. So uh, no matter see, what we do, that, that's what it's going to be. See, I love that because <laughs> I too listen. I loved Fat Man on Batman. He talked to artists. He talked to actors. You know, he would sit there and like you said, he would read the comic. And it was like this almost intimate thing of him in one-on-one. But then yeah. like, he had Mark Bernard and on on. And it was cool they would do something. And then they started, he's like, yeah, we're just going to do the utility belt. They were kind of talking about DC. And then they're like, comics. And then the next thing you know, like, it's Fat Man Beyond. Yeah. Where he's talking about whatever with Mark Miller. And then it, like, became basically the podcast is the audio version of, like, them doing a TV show, like, on YouTube. So it'll be like, do a two shot, one shot, back to you. And then I'm like, I don't even care anymore, man. Yeah. I miss the I miss the goofy theme song you had. Um or was you talking about punching turkeys in the face? Oh, yeah. I remember and, that. That's old school. <laughs> you know, and I, because, you know, in that show, I was listening to hardcore. My wife and I actually went to the, the secret stash and we're actually on an episode of Comic Book Men. That's but our awesome. segment never aired. <laughs> like, I have pictures. We were there and everything, like, but it never, it got cut. Never, yeah. It never aired. But, um, and then it was just like, you know, after, like, I just kept listening and then all of a sudden it was like, it was about whatever. And I was like, man, that's not why I'm tuning in. Like, you know, it was cool when he was directing, like, and he would have, like, the actors and stuff from when he directed The Flash. Like, I mean, if you keep it in the DC sandbox, I'm fine with. Like, yeah. It all connects, you know. Um, and that's kind of my thing. Like, even with Krypton Report, like, next year we're going to do a couple more Batman-themed episodes um, building up for The Batman. You know, we're going to look back at some stuff and – we did some reviews with the Joker, the different Jokers leading up to the Joker back in 2019 and everything. Um, but we're keeping it in the DC sandbox, you know. But if I want to talk about Marvel, I'll go start a Marvel podcast. Yeah. Especially when I'm Kevin Smith and I own my own podcasting network. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll probably on Supergirl Radio, we'll probably talk about The Flash. Tasha Kaje, uh, Supergirl is going to be appearing in that. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, as long I'm, as I'm, I think as long as you have some connection. 
yeah, I can't, I can't really wait till that comes out and just hear your perspective. And I, I mean, I can't wait to listen to you guys talk about the comics and just like what your perspective is on different comics and how her character is, you know, portrayed. Like your your take on Christopher Reeve's Superman in that world, you know, is something that a lot of people don't think about or look at. And the fact that you know you have this different perspective and then you apply that to how Supergirl the character was treated and stuff in the comics at different times and your knowledge of the various forms of Supergirl in those comics is it's great because it just makes it that much more enjoyable for you know listeners who don't have as much knowledge or want to have more knowledge and also I mean just to have a different perspective you know we we you know, listening to your panel like you can tell that people who love superman even though it's the same character and we have different versions they have different perspectives of that character what they like about that character and whatever so yeah here's a hard one for you okay or maybe it's not a hard one favorite live action supergirl i mean it's gonna be melissa benoist but they've all been so good so we have melissa benoist we have helen slater we have laura van Dort, uh sasha kaje is the uh, fourth one we haven't seen like she's, she, of let's say, she's on batter up <laughs> like yeah but she's got that where where she might not be playing Kara thing like it's kind of they haven't officially said you know so it's one of those like then it becomes like okay you're a little different you're you're a supergirl not because when you hear supergirl it's like it's just like you know in the comics like there's batman bruce wayne but then there was also batman dick grayson for a while oh yeah 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 so it's kind of like that like she's supergirl but she's not Kara zorel yeah we're know? we're not so. exactly sure uh where they're taking her or what interpretation they're going with her uh as as of right now but Melissa, I think for me is just, she's such a perfect portrayal. She hasn't got, always gotten the best material because uh, the quality of the show has deteriorated over the last like three seasons. Um, but her, the way she carries herself, her, her Cara Danvers is really good. Her Supergirl is also really good. Um, and she has the ability to grab me emotionally. I mean, I love Supergirl, but I don't love Kara on that show just because I love Supergirl. I love Kara and she's my favorite character because Melissa plays well. Um, so I think for me, Melissa just, she looks the part, she's, she portrays it well, and uh, she's able to make me believe that she is the character. Helen Slater, even though she was in a maybe not so good movie, maybe a little bit of a goofy movie, she still plays uh, Kara Zarell really well. Um, Laura Vandervoort is also great uh, for me. Uh, season seven of Smallville is only good because she's in it. <laughs> um, so, so I, yeah. I, I th- season seven storyline is like, oh, we should have done this storyline back in season five. Oh, we messed up. <laughs> yeah, I think she really her her appearances in season seven, especially she comes around in an eight, but but uh, but I think for me season seven. Um, so I don't think we've had a bad live action Supergirl yet. So I no, guess the pressure no, is don't. on for Sasha Kaje uh, to live up to that expectation. But but I think uh, I think we've had some good run. And I, I agree. Like when you have a television version, I think you know you're going to have episodes that the writing wasn't there, or just you know filler episodes where you're just like, eh, you know, like Dean Kane, uh, Tom Welling, you know. They just had some episodes where they're like, mm. yeah, <laughs> but you can't look at those. You got to, you know, think about the overarching of everything. And, yeah. I mean, yeah, we've had three really good versions of the character, but you know, Melissa's she's done it the most and it's, it's resonated deeper. I mean, and she's owned the character and that's just, that's great to see. Well, I'm out of questions. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I could come up with more, but we've been going for a while and you know, time is precious and all that fun stuff. I could sit here and think of more and more, but you know, that's what we have a second reappearing. Oh, sure. I can always, I can always come back. You want to talk? Oh, of course. Let some time pass. Get your opinion. You know, see, uh, so here's my last question to you is just, how are you feeling about season six of Supergirl right now? Just overarching, you know, not, you don't have to bring it into it. It's just, just overarching. Like, how do you feel about the season? If I'm honest with you and I always try to be honest, uh, I'm disappointed um, 
mostly because I don't feel like it's um, it's really leading to something that is big for our car. I mean, there are some things that are kind of car centric, um, but I think they're having to wrap everybody's character arcs up. And I, I think Kara could potentially get lost. But I, I just don't feel like it's a big celebration of Supergirl. Um, it just doesn't, right. it just doesn't feel like it's like, this is the end of Supergirl's story. Um, and so for mm-hmm. me, I wish the last piece of Supergirl be more of racing, celebrating their Kara. Um, but, you know, I understand, you know, they had like that. They had time to work. But I, I think final show, like final season shows should circle around the, to the beginning and, and really get back to what made the show special in the first place. I, I think that's getting lost. lost. I agree. I, I really agree with you. Um, I feel like this show, let's see, I feel like this show especially, so I think it goes this show, The Flash, and maybe Batwoman or Batwoman Flash you can really see the COVID protocol in the production. Like I really feel it really strong on this show a lot of just how they shoot it, the way they're doing things. Um, And I totally agree with you where I kind of feel like there's certain characters, even like, I don't, I hate saying this because like there's characters I like, like I love supernatural. Okay. I love that show, but Cass should have been gone a lot. Or sooner, and then he could have come back later. But some characters, I know you like them, but when you keep them around, you have to find something for them to do. It just kind of mucks up. And that's how I feel about Dreamer. Um, I think that she should have had her arc for a good two seasons and then left. Um, I like Brainy. I like what they've done with him now, but I feel like he should have, like, cut down. We needed to, like, we had, we extended the supporting cast. We need to start funneling it back down. Um, and make it more Supergirl centric. I mean, you know, you could have, especially after her coming out of the Phantom Zone, you could have, you know, we, we, you and I talked about on the show about with Kelly, um, where she was going in her trajectory on things. And I'm like, you know, Kelly's a character that I like, but I don't need her to be up front. Like she's great as a supporting character. Um, I want to watch Supergirl for Supergirl. We're out of time now. This is the end. It should all be like tight. I should feel something. I should, you know, like be thinking like, man, this is, this is it. Like, um, and maybe they should have like whittled the season, the, the episodes down a little bit or something tight, just tighten the story. Um, yeah, I think now we're, we'll see, I think know? we're now at the point where like in the halfway mark of season six and I think it's starting to possibly get really good. Uh, but now Nick's, uh, I guess the time that we're podcast, uh, Nick is, Kind of reintroducing herself to Kara outside the pantry. Like they yeah. will be going up against each other. So I think that has the potential uh, be a good way to really have uh, a formidable foe. So I think that I think has has good potential and really good for Supergirl. But uh, but to your point, I think they're having to serve their story. Um, and, and they've done a good job with like dream story and tell story, but at the same time, I, I get selfish because I want it more about Supergirl. And, and I would have even, I, I would have even taken more of a Cara Alex, uh, focus just like one, uh, where that was a big part of the show. And that awesome stuff. So I don't know. I'm willing to write it out and see what happens at the end. Oh, yeah. Um, I hope they stick the landing, uh, just because, uh, I talked to so many people who say their first Supergirl. And that's how they got in there. I want really uh, for her. And I mean, that's how I feel about like every Superman. Like, there's some kid out there, you know, whose first Superman is going to be Tyler. Yeah. You know, that's the first one that he saw. Like, we we watched Superman and Lois as a family um, on Wednesday mornings because um, I, I bought the series digitally and everything. And, so we get up and we would watch it and have breakfast and the kids would watch it with me. And, you know, my, my daughter, I'm going to go back and start watching Supergirl from the beginning with her. Cause I feel like she enjoys it and likes it, but there's not always enough Supergirl for her. Yeah. She's like, where's Supergirl daddy? Where's Super-? And like, so her thing now is like, she's watching Stargirl. Oh yeah. Stargirl's She'll watch great. that with me. Yeah. 
Oh, I love Stargirl. That show is awesome. <laughs> um, so that's that's been her, you know, big thing that she's loved. And I just I think it's important, you know, for those shows to to resonate with younger audiences. And it's going to be weird when Supergirl goes because, like like I said earlier, like the show was formed for the Krypton TV series and Supergirl, and now in November both of those are gone. And I have Superman and Lois, and then soon a new Superman animated series. Yeah. So, right. Like you, like you said, I, I, I'll be podcasting for decades. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of material to cover. <laughs> well, thank you. We're gonna put a pen in it here because we could keep going forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, can't jump. This, you could be tuning into <laughs> to Tyler talks to Rebecca Part Seven. <laughs> That's uh, totally fine. That would be great. <laughs> but I want to thank you, Rebecca, for being here. And please uh, go ahead and let everyone know where they can find Supergirl Radio and your info. Yeah, if you want to check out our episodes on Supergirl Radio, if you're interested in Supergirl, we always will be podcasting about Supergirl. So you can find our website at supergirlradio.com. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Supergirl Radio. Uh, We are also on YouTube. We uh, live stream to YouTube and Facebook, but uh, most of our uh, listeners and viewers will gather on uh, join the live chat there. So you can check that out at youtube.com slash BCTV podcast with an S. Uh, so uh, make sure you subscribe. That'll be a way to get up with our stuff. But we live stream now. Uh, we're currently live streaming every Wednesday. Our schedule has gotten a little shifted because of Superman and Lois and Supergirl uh, episodes s- switching air dates. So we've kind of had to adjust our podcasting schedules. But um, but for right now, we're on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. That was- we would love to have you chat. All right. Well, there you have it. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for Supergirl Radio. It's a great listen. Fun, good time. So just check it out. Look up in the, sky. the Krypton Report is a Tears production. We thank you for listening and enjoying, and please support us on our Patreon account, our T Public store, and check out our social media. Always remember to look up in the sky. Hey, can I get a dollar? Sure. That's what friends say, right? And we all know that we all have a dollar. We spend a dollar on crazy stuff. We have a loose change around the house probably for a dollar. So why not help a friend out? The Krypton Report, of course, has a Patreon like every podcast does. But unlike other podcasts where we're asking for a lot of money, we're just saying, hey, shoot us a dollar. One dollar a month. Help us keep the podcast going and help us to bring entertainment to you. And you can hear the fun voices of me and James. So go to patreon.com slash Krypton Report. And give it a shot. Thanks. If you enjoy Superman podcasting, here's some others to check out. Digging for Kryptonite. The Last Sons of Krypton. The Aspiring Kryptonian. That all comes back to Superman. Superman Forever. All-Star Superman Podcast. Superman the Animated Podcast. Always Hold On to Smallville. And Superboy Legacy Podcast. Check them out. Always a good time. Always something new. Enjoy. Enjoy.